Object-oriented programming is bad. It leads to lots of boilerplate code and it's slow. Writing object-oriented code in Python is stupid. It's like writing Java code in Python. When I started this YouTube channel and I posted a couple of my videos on design patterns on the Python subreddit, these were some of the responses I got from the community. I mean, these comments weren't entirely off the mark. In those early videos I posted, there were lots of things to improve for sure. In particular, the way I wrote my code could be done in a more Pythonic fashion. But for a while now, I've been going through a journey discovering how object-oriented programming isn't bad per se. So in this video, I'm going to share five insights I got during that journey that'll help you avoid some of the pitfalls and that will allow you to do object-oriented programming well. Sounds good? Before I dive in, I have a free guide for you. You can get it at ariancodes.com slash design guide. It describes the seven steps I take whenever I design a new piece of software. It's not about object-oriented programming in particular, but more about how to approach a software design problem and what you need to think about. If you enter your email address on the site, you get the guide in your inbox right away. To start, I want to give you a bit of background of where I'm coming from, how I've learned about object-oriented programming, and how I've been using it in my own software development projects. When I started studying computer science in 1995, Java just appeared on the scene. It wasn't yet part of my curriculum in my first and second year. I learned mainly modular 2 and C++, but very quickly, the entire education sector changed to Java. In some sense, Java encapsulates the worst of object-oriented programming. It's verbose, you can't not use a class in your program, so it invites you to write really complex programs and structures. It was quickly adopted by businesses to write very complex designs with deep inheritance hierarchies, very long class names, overly complex software structures fed by complex design processes involving many stakeholders. Waterfall, rational, unified process, these things. I still see some teachers doing this approach with Java and I think it's for a big part responsible for the hatred against object-oriented programming. So if you had a computer science education like that, I can't blame you for not liking object-oriented programming. Over the years, I've moved from writing purely object-oriented code to what's relying more on functional programming. This is also because I've been developing a lot of software using React and TypeScript for my company. Like Python, TypeScript has great support for functional programming, and React relies a lot on functional components, so moving to functional programming really came quite natural to me. You may have seen part of this shift in my YouTube videos over the last year. It doesn't mean I don't like object-oriented programming though. Used carefully, classes can really help you write cleaner, more readable code. So here are five things that I learned about object-oriented programming and how to do it well. The first thing that I learned is that there's no need to go fully only object-oriented programming or only functional programming. I find that a combination of both of these actually works really well. And Python actually supports that. You can use classes, you can use regular functions. Python has lots of functional programming tools, especially if you use the func tools package, which is really useful. So use whatever fits best and what results in the most readable code. And I'll just show you a quick example of how different the things are that I use and I use them together to create, in my opinion, pretty readable code that you wouldn't get if you were only using functional programming or only object-oriented programming. For example, here I have an example that is from another video where I have a credit card class, so that's object-oriented, right? So it has a number, expiry month, expiry year. So this is used to represent data. It's a data class. And then I have other files as well, like I have an order, which is more classes, well, enum, that's actually also kind of a class in Python. I have a line item class that has a property to compute the total. I have an order class that uses, again, line items it also has a property and a method. So these are all pretty class oriented. But if you look, for example, at this is another example, payment processor, well, that's also a class, but there is also at the bottom a function to check the validity of a credit card. So this is a function, it's not a class. And same for processing a payment, I have a function that gets a payment processor and an order and a credit card and then does some checks, charges the card and pays the order. So what you see here is really a combination of using object-oriented programming and functional programming. Well, I wouldn't really call this hardcore functional programming. I mean, I'm not using partial function application or wizardry like that, but 
I'm using functions, not only classes and objects. So to me, this seems like code that's easy to read and feels natural and intuitive to me to work in this way. So there's no need to limit yourself. Just use what fits best and what results in, in your opinion, the most readable and cleanest code. A second tip, and that's also something that you can see pretty clearly in this particular example, is what I generally do is if I use classes, I make them either behavior oriented or data oriented. Here we have the credit card class. This is clearly a data oriented class. The main purpose of this class is to structure my data. I want the credit card number, the expiry month and the expiry year to be in a single object so that I can easily access them. And that when I use this object, it's clear what all these things mean. So it's really data oriented. If you look at the processor, the payment processor, on the other hand, this is not data oriented at all. The only data that it has is an API key, but then it has mostly methods for checking the API key, for charging a credit card, for validating a credit card, etc., etc. That's That's all behavior. And you also see that I don't have a bunch of instance variables in this class. It's, it's pretty simple, you know, the data that's in there, that's at the moment only the API key. So this is really a behavior focused class. Then we have order, which is again, a more data focused class. And there is some methods to do something with the data, like changing the order status or computing the total, but I'm keeping it pretty lightweight. I'm not adding a bunch of methods to the order class to make it do everything and the kitchen sink. So this is generally how I approach classes. Either they're very much focused on data and structuring data, or they're focused on grouping behavior. And often the classes that are grouping behavior, you can simply turn into functions because they don't need a lot of data. So if you just turn them into functions, you don't need to create an object and it's generally much simpler. But the data focused classes, those are pretty useful and I generally leave them in the code. So for example, here I could imagine that payment processor wouldn't be a class, but would actually be a module with these functions in it instead of it being a class like it is right now. So data focused or behavior focused. Don't try to combine those things into a single class. Keep them separate, makes things a lot simpler. The third tip concerns inheritance. In general, be very careful with inheritance. Actually, when I look at the way that I use inheritance, and this is actually also the case for most of the classic design patterns, is that inheritance is actually mainly used to define interfaces and types of things that you expect to use. So don't use deep hierarchies of classes, uh, inheriting from other classes, modifying the behavior a little bit, and then there's another subclass that complicates things even further. Remember that when you inherit from a class, when you create a subclass, you're actually adding complication because you're introducing a new level and you need to think about how these levels interact. How does the things that you do in a superclass interact with the things that you do in a subclass? And you quickly end up in a mess because those things are going to be in two different places. One part in a superclass, another part in a subclass. So it's gonna be hard to find. It's gonna be hard to understand what's actually happening. And that's why it's a good thing to limit really limit the depth of your inheritance hierarchies. And when I look at my own code, I almost never use inheritance except for uh, inheriting from an abstract base class or using a protocol to define the interface. And in that case, you won't use inheritance because that uses structural uh, typing in Python, but the idea is the same. You use the inheritance, you use the, the class mechanism to define the interface and then uh, you inherit from that or you implement the protocol and that's how you make the connection and not via subclasses, which just complicates things, basically. Uh, you can actually see it happening here in this particular code example where I have my payment processor, which is, well, it's not that complicated, but you can imagine that this could be a pretty big class. And then when I have my payment file where I'm paying an order, so I have pay order function here, it gets an order and a payment processor and a credit card and that's computes a couple of things. But here you see that I actually have a payment processor protocol class. And pay order is not dependent on this particular payment processor, even though the name is the same. It depends on a locally defined protocol. So that means that at this point, if you want to use pay order with another payment processor, well, as long as it implements this charge method, you can use it. 
So you can use it with another payment processor or even with a class from a third party that happens to implement the charge method in this way. So there's a lot more options this way. And I'm using here a protocol. You could also use an abstract base class if you wanted to. It's kind of similar. But here there's no inheritance relationship, which I think is nice in this particular example. But without these deep inheritance hierarchies, the code stays relatively simple. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, give it a like. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm to push this video out to more people. I appreciate that very much. So the next step, that's tip number four, I think. Use dependency injection. It's really helpful in decoupling things and it really builds nicely on the idea of the previous tip that you're using interfaces for objects to connect with each other. The connection you make using dependency injection. Here's an example of how that will work. Again, this is about payment. Somehow I really love talking about payment. I don't, but it's just the example that I happen to have. Anyway, I have a Stripe payment handler that handles a payment for a certain amount. I have here a constant that has a couple of prices for things, very healthy food, as you can see. Well, there is a salad, so that's pretty good. We have an order food function that gets the items, computes the sum and creates the payment handler and then uh, prints thanks for your business and you can then order some food. So pretty simple example, pretty meaningless, but it, it's just to show uh, how, how it works. So this isn't using dependency injection at the moment. Because we're not using dependency injection, it means that a function like order food is actually pretty hard to test because it creates its own Stripe payment handler. And that might be a complicated object that connects with the Stripe backend, etc., etc. which let's say you want to write tests for this, you definitely don't want to do that because that's going to complicate things a lot and you may ac accidentally really charge somebody for a burger and for some fries. So we don't want that. If you use dependency injection, so I have also an after version of this, then instead of creating the payment handler in order food, we pass it along as an argument to the function. And that makes it a lot easier to test because here you also see in the main function, I call order food and there I create the payment handler. So if you want to test this function, you can simply do the same call, but you provide another object of another type. And then that object can fake being the Stripe payment handler. So you can test the rest of the order food function. So dependency injection is a really powerful mechanism for connecting things when you're writing object-oriented code. And even here, we're combining that with regular functions, it's still pretty powerful. What you really wanna end up with in the end is that the dirty details where everything is patched up together, that that's in a single place in your code. And that's actually what's happening here because we have the main function and that's where all the details are. This contains the, the things that we wanna order, and it also contains the actual payment handler that we want to use in this particular piece of code. So here we're patching up things and then order food and payment handle, they're more independent. You can go even a step further by not making this a Stripe payment handler, but by using a protocol class or an abstract base class. And then you would have your dependency inversion principle as well, because then order food wouldn't depend directly on Stripe payment handler. It would depend on an interface and then you can provide any specific payment handler you'd want here in the main function. So use dependency injection, dependency inversion to connect things and do make those connections at a single place. And that also makes your code a lot easier to test. A final thing that I've learned, and that's more Python specific, is that because Python is a really powerful language, it's actually one of the few languages that allows so much control over how the internals of the language work due to all the dunder methods and instance variables that you can change a lot in Python about how those things work. For example, I have here um, a payment class that overrides the new dunder method to return a particular type of payment object. Here in the main function, I'm using this class to create a payment of type card, but that's actually going to create a Stripe payment object. And I've talked about this in other videos as well. This is actually a really bad idea because now my payments, if you look at this code, well, if you would expect this to be of type payment, right? Because you are using the payment initializer, but actually it's not, it's of type strike payment, which is really weird. So this leads to surprises if you do this. And there's no need to do this in this complicated way because here you see we have to override a bunch of uh, Donner methods object dot uh, new we have to call so it's it's pretty cryptic if you're not a python expert you 
probably have no idea what's happening here. And there's of course a much simpler way to do it, which is by using uh, something like a factory, for example. Or here I have an adapted example where I'm using an enum, that's the payment method. And then I have my PayPal and Stripe payment classes that implement a protocol. And then I simply define a dictionary with payment methods. And then here I just access that dictionary instead of going through all these Donder methods instead. So in my opinion, this is much cleaner and it doesn't lead to as many surprises. So if you feel like you have to use these low level Donder methods a lot, it's probably a sign that you should rethink your design a bit. And if there are, if there is a way to make things a bit simpler and a bit more straightforward, having code that's straightforward is really important because then later on in a couple of months, when you want to change the code again, or when some other developer wants to work on the code, it's going to save you a lot of time if that code is really easy to read and easy to follow. So keep things simple and don't abuse all these Donner methods too much unless that's absolutely necessary. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like. Consider subscribing to my channel if you want to learn more about software design and software development. Thanks for watching, take care and see you soon.